Nearing our place for landing, we looked for marker lights, but there were none visible, so we had to trust to the accuracy of our navigation and hope that we were landing in the right place. We released from our tug and glided down to about 30 feet above ground level and put on the large landing lights to see where the poles were. French resistance had warned that the Germans had put posts in open spaces. We made a safe landing, only losing part of a wing. Only one other glider of the six which left Blakehill Farm landed near us at Toufrill, carrying a similar cargo, piloted by Staff Sergeant Banks and Sergeant Heppelwhite. About five minutes later, the paras landed, collected the jeeps and trailers and drove off to blow up the bridges over the river Deves to stop the Germans advancing towards the beaches where our troops were landing. I later learned that their mission had been accomplished. Many years later, I read that the two paratroopers dropped in the area to set up the landing light markers were captured by a German patrol. In a flagrant breach of the Geneva Convention, universally agreed by all countries regarding treatment of prisoners of war, they were taken down a farm track and shot through the back of the head. Direct order from Hitler. At 7am, all hell was let loose. The sky was full of bombers, the Navy opened up with their guns and rockets, and the ground shook. We pilots stayed and fought with the paras before making our way to the coast. We crossed the Pegasus Bridge on our way. We had passes to hitch a lift on any ship or boat going back to England. When we arrived at Reading Railway Station on Thursday the 9th of June, with no English money, only French francs, we could not buy any food. But when the staff knew where we had been, they said, Breakfast on the house. On arrival at Blakehill Farm, we had a party in the sergeant's mess, after debriefing, of course. More routine training before our next operation. During July, our land forces made strong advances through France and Belgium, and the generals devised a plan which they hoped would shorten the war. The plan being to drop a strong airborne force by glider and parachutes north of the River Rhine near Arnhem, and another near Nijmegen, south of the River Waal. The operation to be called Market Garden. The preservation of the bridges over these two rivers was of the utmost importance to the advancing guards' armoured division. On the 17th of December 1944, we led the squadron on the first lift to Arnhem. Our load was Brigadier Hicks and his headquarters staff. We landed up close to the woods landing zone, S leaving room on the field for the rest of the squadron. Two gliders released too late and flew over us and crashed straight into the woods. The noise was horrendous. I doubt if anyone survived. There was not much shooting on the landing areas. We started to march in open order down a long road through the woods. The quietness didn't last long. Shells started bouncing off trees and mortar bombs were exploding near us. To me this was frightening as I'd never been an infantryman under fire. As night drew in we started to dig slit trenches. The ground was very hard so I concentrated on length. I am six foot three inches tall rather than depth. I realised my mistake when small arms fire and mortar bombs started exploding around us. At first light, I frantically dug my trench much deeper. Alas, no sooner had I done that than the order, move, came. I cannot remember what happened on the second day, but on the third day, Tuesday, we were heading towards the bridge when we were attacked by Fokker Wolf's 190 fighters. I ran for cover under the fir trees with several other pilots. I was hit by a bullet which lodged near the base of the spine, but Staff Sergeant Banks and Sergeant Heppelwhite and five others were killed.
Staff Sergeant Banks was nicknamed Admiral because prior to joining the GPR, he was an AA gunner on a merchant ship trading to and from the Manx. He was a great friend. After being wounded, I and the other wounded pilots were taken to a field hospital. We were laid on the floor on our stretchers in a large room which had a glass roof. There was gunfire all around the building. A large pane of glass fell down on the fellows in the stretchers one day. Fortunately, it fell horizontally or they would have been badly injured. Another day, two shells came through one wall and out through the opposite wall. I was surprised at the heat which they gave off. Luckily, there were two wounded Germans on stretchers with us, and quick as a flash, a Red Cross orderly rushed over and dragged one of the Germans outside to stop the Tiger tank firing any more shells. The tank commander thought there were snipers in the building, despite the building displaying large red crosses. But he did stop. Twice during the eight days I was there, the Germans took over, but the Dutch nurses never left. They were wonderful. We often heard the words spoken on a loud hailer. You Tommies are surrounded. Give yourselves up. Whereupon we would hear a Bren gun open fire, as much to say, no way. When the fighting was all over, we were taken by lorries to a hospital train in a railway siding next to a flak train. When the guns on the flak train fired on our aircraft, they never returned the fire. We presume they knew there were prisoners on the train. The train took us to Appledorn, to a Dutch barracks converted into a makeshift hospital. Very makeshift. They only had paper bandages. An officer in my room climbed into the roof and I heard was able to make a successful escape. <laughs>